So you're considering a small pickup truck just to use to, you know, carry things around, run garbage, whatever you got to do, right? You just need a running pickup truck. It doesn't have to be fancy and it doesn't have to be expensive. It can't be expensive. Let's just say that it cannot be expensive. So what do you choose? Something from the 90s? Well, there's a lot of options and a lot of them are pretty good. For your consideration, I present today the first generation Dodge Dakota. So welcome everybody to the channel. If you don't already know, my name is Andy. This is that car vlog channel. And this is my 1994 Dodge Dakota SLT. In today's video, it's gonna be kind of a buyer's guide of sorts. We're gonna take you around the truck and we're gonna talk about some of the things you should look out for when considering one of these. Um, some of the maintenance concerns, some possible fixes. A lot of these things are old car stuff. You know, any car is going to have them, we'll cover that as well. And it's going to be a little bit of information about these trucks, so you can use that as part of your consideration for buy, possibly buying one of these trucks. Now, there's a lot of options out there for small trucks from the 90s. Of course, you have the Dodge Dakota, you've got the Chevy S10, you've got a Ford Ranger. Um, if you want to go foreign, there's Nissan hard body pickup trucks. I had one of those. Um, you've got the Toyota pickups. Plenty of options, and most of them pretty good. This was the 90s. Everything, all American stuff was pretty much still American. The Japanese was still really good stuff. And a lot of good things came out of, out of that time period as far as trucks are concerned. However, they are old now. So we're going to talk about old car stuff, specifically on this first generation of Dodge Dakota. First off, let's talk styling and overall visual configuration. So of course this is obviously the extended cab version of the truck with the standard six, six and a half foot bed. Now these trucks, this generation, first generation ran from 87 to 96, after which Dodge redesigned them to the second generation pickup truck. Um, now I have had some people online accuse me of this being a second gen, but this is not a second gen. This is a face lifted first gen. This is a 94. It's getting a little closer to the end of the generation. Anyway. This is the extended cab SLT version. Up until 1990, so pretty much in the 80s, you could not get an extended cab that didn't make it. 90 was the first year. Before then, the only option you had was a regular cab with just the doors. You had the bed. You also had the option of an eight foot bed from what I understand, which was never an option on the extended cab truck. So if you go with the extended cab, you're getting the standard size bed. This is a four-wheel drive truck. You can kind of see how it sits right now. Of course, the aftermarket has plenty of options for lifting these things, putting bigger tires on them. As far as the way it looks, I think this is probably the best looking truck of the early to mid 90s, especially after they redesigned the front end. Let me get, take you around to the front end. You can see at first these trucks didn't have these what they call the arrow headlights where they kind of formed to the shape of the truck. They're, they were, had sealed beam headlights. They're a bit more blocky looking. I, I personally don't think they look as, as good. There are plenty of people who would prefer that style over this. I like the way this looks. Now you didn't get clear signals and corners or signals in, with, on these trucks. They did have orange, just regulars. Um, these corners do nothing. They're just reflective. I put those on, those are aftermarket ANZO clears, and I like, I like the way they look. Once again, there is an aftermarket for these trucks. Some things could be a bit harder to find than they are for other trucks, such as taillights, um, as far as aftermarket, you know, that looks different from stock, but there are still options to modify these trucks, and I really like the way that looks. All right, now throughout the model run of this first generation Dakota, you've got three engine options. First being a 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine, which... I have a hard time imagining anybody would put an extended cab truck simply because it's probably going to be a bit heavier and yeah. You also got the option of a 3.9 liter V6 which I have seen in these trucks and you have this a 5.2 liter V8 which you may also hear referred to as the 318 cubic inch. Going back to when we still refer to engine displacement as in terms of cubic inches instead of liters. Once again this is the 5.2 liter V8 and this is I think the best engine option. It's got the most power, it's got good pulling capacity, and it just sounds great. These 318s, 
even with crap exhaust, just make really good sounds. Now, mine, I upgraded to a Borla exhaust, actually a Borla muffler, single muffler, single pipe going out, and I think it sounds great. I'll let you have a listen to that right now. Let's get on with it, you say. What do I need to look for when buying one of these trucks? All right, we're gonna go ahead and start that. Now, in order to obtain the information I needed for this video, <clears throat> I actually took to the internet to, at my, to my favorite source of information for these trucks, which I will get to in a bit. Disclaimer, I am no expert on these things. A lot of this stuff I did not know about. I've only had the truck just a few months shy of two years, and there's still a lot of stuff I'm figuring out about. However, I do have a lot of information. I have cheat sheets. So if you hear or see me wrestling with papers in the video, that's because there's no way I'm going to remember everything. But I wanted to go and deliver this information to y'all in the form of a buyer's guide video. So let's start right here under the hood of the truck. First thing is PCV valve going out. Now this is an old car problem. Now on the, the 318 to 5.2, your PCV is located right here in this passenger side valve cover. And it just pulls in and out real easy, very cheap part. Very cheap part, very easy to replace, and keeps your crankcase ventilated properly. Once again, it's an old car thing. I've, I've never had a car that didn't have that because I've always driven old cars. A couple of people said to mention the radiators. Apparently the radiators wear out, they go bad, they crack and leak. Once again, old car stuff. This is a 94, it's 27 years old. You're probably eventually going to get to the point that, you know, the radiator wears out. You know, it is, they already started using plastic by now, plastic and aluminum. So they're going to wear out faster than, say, the radiator on my old Chevy truck, my 76, it's all metal. A lot of people talked about the ECM, the computer, going bad. Apparently, I had three tell me about that. Apparently, these computers, they can get old, they can go bad. They're, I believe this is it right here. A lot of 90s vehicles had them under the hood still. And so, you know, if it goes bad, you got to find a replacement. Luckily, it's, they're not as complex as a lot of modern cars, like my wife's 2015 Town of Country. And you can mostly just change these out and have a good run of truck. A few people mentioned water pump wearing out. Now down here is the water pump. So right here-ish is a nice shiny metal bit. You can kind of see it in there. The water pumps on these do go out. Now Dodge Dakotas in the first and even the second generation are known to wear out water pumps. Um, that one person advised me that if you got a truck and it doesn't appear that the water pump has been replaced. If you get around two to 300,000 miles, replace that water pump. And of course, and while you're at it, just go ahead and do the, the serpentine belt and everything. Just make sure it's in good running order. It looks like the previous owner replaced this one already, so I'm not gonna have to worry about that. But I do know that they're a problem in both the first and second generation trucks. My dad had the second gen with the V6, and in the few years that he owned that truck, he replaced like two or three of them. So they can be an issue, just keep your eye on those. Um, thermostat. Thermostats can go bad and cause engine overheating. What I read was just make sure you've got to replace it with a good 180 degree thermostat. You shouldn't have any problem. Timing chains at about 200 to 300,000 miles is also something that I heard. I also heard that the V6s like to eat chiming chains. So it's also something to keep in mind. Keep a listen out for your chain. Um, obviously with all this stuff on the front of the engine, it's going to be quite a job to get to that. So if it's something you're considering doing, commit to it, get it done. Several people in this group that I'm in online talk about this right here, the blower motor resistor. So here it is, you can see it on the firewall. Of course it goes into the firewall. This, um, if you don't know what a resist blower motor resistor is, this is what helps you have multiple fan speeds on your AC blower motor. Without this thing in working order, it'll blow one speed all the time, or it might not even turn off, or it might not turn on. These things like to wear out, especially with age, and people have to replace them. Now, they look like a fairly easy replacement. Um, I've seen plenty of pictures where wires were rusted and corroded and broken off. Things inside and outside were melted. This one, I believe, it looks to me like it's already been replaced mainly because all, all the replacements I've seen online have this yellow back. It's also something to keep in mind. If you start having trouble with your blower fan, 
you're probably looking at blower resistor. Several people, several, several people mentioned vacuum line. As cars progressed and got more and more emissions, features put on them to try to cut down, they started getting more and more vacuum lines. And as these things age, they get brittle, they like to crack, they start leaking. Something else to keep in mind, you get one of these, kind of get up under the hood with it running, listen for a possible sound of sucking air. Um, if it starts running bad, that's something to look for and replace the lines to keep it going. One person mentioned a cracked exhaust manifold. I'm not sure how common that is. I don't see, I haven't seen that problem on mine. This is them right there, the exhaust manifold below the spark plugs. So not sure on that. Um, I've seen, as I've gone through the group before, several people mentioned also the throttle position sensor possibly being bad. Also something you wanna look into. Um, had a few mention AC issues. Now right here is your air conditioning compressor. Once again, these trucks are old. The newest of these trucks is, see, mine's a 27, so the newest of these trucks is 24 years old. So you're gonna have things wear out, AC compressors and whatnot. Now, I don't know if mine is original or not. I do know it still works. Uh, I did have to recharge it to get it to cool down in there. I don't know if it has an active leak or if it's just gone down over the years but that's also something else to look out for. Ignition coils. I believe this here is your ignition coil. Apparently those can also go bad. Um, looks like a fairly simple thing to get to and replace if it ever does go bad. Uh, I heard about air, air idle control valves. Those can go bad as well. When you're doing a tune-up, they say make sure if you've got a truck which uses a cap and rotor for ignition, which I believe all of them do, and just like on Chevrolet, just like on my old Chevy, here it is in the back, way in the back. Under there should be a cap and rotor. Um, you go to replace those, just make sure you get a good one. Make, don't cheap out, or else they'll wear out quicker. Get you a good one. A lot of people talk about oil pressure on these trucks. Now, I've actually seen this on my truck. I've seen sometimes where the oil pressure gauge, way over there, just to the right of the speedometer, actually, on the bottom, that's oil pressure gauge. And I've seen that get where it reads kind of low and uh, the light flashes for a minute, especially if I'm running the air conditioner and I'm just sitting there idling. Now, not sure if that's the gauge malfunctioning, not sure if the oil pressure sender is going bad or if it's actually getting a low oil pressure. Something else to keep in mind, it doesn't do it often, but it does do it and a lot of people have talked about that as well. Um, on that note, one person mentioned that there's a bronze bushing on the oil pump drive which i don't once again i don't know everything about these trucks but if they're if they work anything like an old chevy then that's going to be on the bottom made it's going to made up to the bottom of the distributor shaft in the back of the engine they say that can go bad and that can cause issues with pressure as well and one or two people said engines need replaced well i you know Engines can need replaced from time to time, depending on you know, how well a vehicle is maintained, how much money you put into taking care of it. The biggest thing, especially as they age, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Keep the oil changed. My oil still gets changed every 3,000 miles, regardless of what anybody says, because of the age of this truck. This one has over 202,000 miles, and it still runs very well. The oil, every 3,000 miles period, keep a clean air filter in it. You know, um, make sure your spark plugs and wires are good. I replaced um, the plugs. I didn't do the wires. I don't think I needed them. But I did the plugs when I, shortly after getting this truck. And just, just, you know, maintain it. It's old. Just like people, you get old, you need maintenance. All right. That is the engine bay. Let's move on to other parts of the truck. All right. Had to take a quick break from filming to go pick up a grill, but let's get back to it. Next, we're going to go underneath the truck and talk about some of the common things down there. Most of it is up front. Now, if we get down here, we can see here we have, here we have our tie rods. Um, up in, here's the control arms. There's your upper control arm, there's your lower. You get those papers out so they're not rustling. And of course, there's a ball joint on each one. Now, people talk about the control arm bushings wearing out and you have to replace the control arms. I, I'm assuming that's true. I know on my old Chevy, of course, I keep comparing Dodge and Chevy, but on my old Chevy, I was able to replace just the uh, bushings. 
but they say those those wore out have to be replaced and those can be difficult to find the control arms ball joints also like to go out which once again it's a 27 year old truck the newest one of these is 25 so this stuff's going to be worn out you're probably going to end up needing ball joints tie rod ends that kind of thing eventually anyways and then of course an alignment um, there's com there's complaints of loose steering once again these components can contribute to that i've also heard that the steering shafts like to wear out on some of the some of the trucks um some people say they do other people say that their trucks go forever without that problem the absolute most common thing on these trucks however is right here frame rust now you know I'll, it's always said most northern cars you don't want them because they're going to be susceptible to frame rust a lot more than southern cars however from my understanding almost all these dakotas do this and they can cause problems when it comes to replacing parts um i actually recently within the last several months experienced this myself so let's go put underneath the truck Right here, I'm hoping you can see, is where the rear shocks attach to this frame cross member. Now this is extremely rusty. Now keep in mind, not all extremely rusty things are rotten and shot. My frame is actually still very solid. It just doesn't look like it. But of course, not only is the frame rust, but the bolts that held this on were so rusted that I almost couldn't get them off. I thought I was going to have to grind them. Luckily I didn't. In fact, they didn't even break somehow. But they were so hard to get out, I just had to put in new hardware bolts right there because there was no reusing those other bolts. So if, uh, if you're a fanatic, if you feel like taking your truck apart and uh, making it pretty, you know, fixing it up, possibly somewhat restoring it, your frame's gonna be a big one. You're gonna have to clean this up a lot and paint it. These frames are notorious for this. And okay, moving on to the body of the truck. So we've done the engine, we've done underneath the body of the truck. Aside from the styling, which once again, I think is one of the best looking 90s trucks there is, especially with the aero headlights. I've not heard much about these bodies. Now I have heard plenty of reports of rust under these fender flares. And that's just something that pretty much any vehicle with age that has fender flares like this, you're gonna wanna check for rust underneath there. Like right now, I'm feeling, I'm feeling mine. I'm not so sure I have any rust issue on mine. I might be one of the lucky ones. Either that or there's just something I'm not seeing and if, if I pull it off, I'm gonna see it. But big deal, a lot of people report that. Um, this black side molding here, this stuff will fall off again with age. This side I believe was already gone when I bought the truck. Um, right here, you know, starting to come off here on the behind the wheel arch. I just noticed that the other day. A passenger door, it was attached. It was a black piece just like this. It said Dakota 4x4, and it started flopping in the wind. So at the risk of my paint, I just ripped it the rest of the way off. But otherwise, not really a lot to say about the bodies of these trucks. They hold up pretty well. Of course, you know, it depends on how you take care of it. If you're bad with cars, if you wreck them, crash into things, whatever. This one's pretty straight. It looks bad, but that's paint. I actually have probably one or two dents. Biggest thing that I've experienced with this has to do with the doors. And so I'm going to take a pretty big risk here. I'm going to open my driver's side door. Now I've not been using my driver's side door because of this. And listen to this. First of all, look how hard it is for me to open it. And then, okay, so it's open now. So we go in here, and I'm hoping maybe you could see when I get in here. Here's the lower door hinge. Now these hinges are welded onto the doors, okay? But they're bolted to this part of the body. And what happens is over time, these welds start to give out. So right here, you can see this weld is starting to break. And right along in here, it's starting to have some problems. If we go up to the top hinge, you can see right here, it's starting to break loose from the door. This is apparently a bit of a common issue, especially on the later models of this generation of truck. Um, from what I've been told, you know, they started getting a little bit cheaper with the metal and it started getting a little weaker. What I'm going to have to have done here is have these, the door taken off, the hinges completely removed. And I'm going to have to have metal put in behind to reinforce it before these hinges get welded back on. So my door does now. <laughs> now let me make sure my little latch is in a good position because it likes to, uh, it likes to not be. It looks good. Okay. 
What I should do with my door now is first listen when I go to close it. Oh, well, usually it makes a very loud popping noise. But see, it's not closing. Now give me a minute while I fix that. So what I've had to do now is when I close the door, push down and slam and it closes. I haven't been using that door in the last several weeks, actually since right around Easter, simply because I don't want those wells to give the, give the rest of the way and you know break off. Um, I am going to open the door again. Well, let's go to the other side actually. I'm not gonna open that door again. So hinges can be a problem. Also, if right here, here is the door switch. This is obviously what, when the door closes, it pushes this, turns your dome light off, and then and now it's on. These like to wear out. These like to stick. Um, these are actually still kind of an old design, just all metal. My old 76 C10 has ones just like this, and they're seized. Um, these, are gonna, these have to be replaced eventually. My driver's side one, I tried to, and uh, I was not successful. I'll have to go try that again. But these wear out will need replaced. Another big thing someone told me on these was for the entire body, check the grounds everywhere where you might have lights or any, anything electrical that requires a body ground. If you can find it, check it, make sure it looks good, clean it up, new hardware if it needs it, because with age, these things do corrode, they rust, and the grounds can go bad. I'm not experiencing any, what I believe to be any bad ground issues right now. So hopefully I don't have to deal with that. I personally have not checked them, mainly because I just simply don't have time to do that. But that's something somebody else advised is check the body grounds and make sure they're good, that you have good electrical contact. Oh, there's that popping sound. The passenger side door is doing it now. I'm afraid my doors are gonna fall off the truck. All right, now let's go inside the truck and talk about the interior problems and quirks. Now the very first thing as we open the door is right here. This is just a little bezel around this door opening handle, okay? Now you see it's in place here, which there's gonna be some very jealous people in that uh, group I'm a part of when they see this video. But over here on the driver door, you can see it's broken off. And in fact, I believe I still have it in my glove box right here. The, yeah, this is it right here. Somehow it was still with the truck right here these love to break off i don't know if they just break or you know if you try to remove the door panel the door card it comes off when that happens but these break and apparently good ones are not easy to find anymore problem um also headliner headliner can be a problem mine no longer has a headliner i took it out planning to redo it um i actually started making a video on that but i everything kind of went crazy especially um, last fall, a lot of stuff happened and then, you know, more stuff with COVID. So just, you know, ran out of time to take care of it. I'm running all metal right now. Eventually I'll get a headliner put in, but the headliners can go bad on these things. They'll sag. Um, the foam board underneath can look kind of bad. So you gotta, and you gotta be really careful with it. Cause apparently you can't replace that except with another used piece, unless I'm wrong, but this is what I've come to understand um you can see the visors here they're the same deal this stuff and you know this stuff can't be pinned back up i actually tried to pin my headliner back up with some twist pins out of walmart's fabric department like my dad used to do when we were growing up he had an 87 buick park avenue that, that well okay i was kind of the cause of it i was the cause of it but it sagged and he used those obviously that car wasn't as old in the 90s as this thing is now Problems I'm having with my truck that I can only assume other people might have. Here is the passenger seat belt. You notice it's just kind of laying here. It's that long. This tensioner is actually seized, so it will retract in. I think it might be done retracting though, but you can't pull it back out. Now I know these things can lock up in the event of an accident. I doubt this thing's been in an accident, but that is seized up and I've got to get a new one. So it is kind of risky riding the passenger side of my truck, but until I can get a new one and uh, reattach it, that's just how it's gonna be. I don't know if that's common, but mine is having that issue. As far as this, this is, well, used to be the driver's side seatbelt buckle. So let me fish the other two out. It kind of looked like this before, but uh, one day I went, I went to uh, Oak Ridge or something and I went to get out of the truck and it would not turn me loose. It would not let go. And it ended up, I had to 
squeezed myself out of the buckle and finally when I got it done it broke. I have been to scrap yards to find parts for these trucks and almost every single one of them I found this buckle would look just like this when it should look like that. Apparently, I'm guessing all of them do this eventually so that's something to look out for as well. I haven't replaced that yet in fact I just kind of bring my belt over and buckle it into what would be the middle seats buckle works just as well it's only a few more inches. Uh, behind this cover are two bolts that hold the seat back in place. Now I'm not going to take it apart but essentially what you have here is you have you know the L-shaped hinging mechanism the tilt mechanism that I think is bad in this truck I don't know on both sides anyway and there's a big steel pin on this side and there's a hole a matching hole in the seat and it slides over that pin and there's two bolts that go in behind here and bolt it down. Mine broke. One of the two of mine broke on that side. And so I had to actually, it's actually when I found out that these buckles all did this when I went to the scrapyard to find the bolts to put in there. And I had to take the seat back off and get inside and extract the other half of the bolt. Um, I don't know if that's common or not. Um, I feel like maybe we're maybe Dodge putting a little bit too much faith in two bolts back here and only putting the pin on the other side. I'm not entirely certain. Um, I wasn't able to get an answer as far as to if that's common or not, but that's what happened with mine. Right here, factory radio. Um, I've heard that some of these will go bad. Of course, they're old. This is not the factory radio. Obviously, it's a JVC from Walmart. Um, I'll throw a picture of the factory radio up here on the screen. It's actually in my first video on the truck. Mine went bad. It started going all crazy. It just started flashing a bunch of weird symbols and making noises and it was just time to go you may end up having to replace that and you may end up doing it anyway because that is the 90s radio with a cassette player and uh let's face it even cds are on their way out now so this thing doesn't even do cds it's just bluetooth on the automatics and let me actually climb over here to the other side and fire the truck up once again this is automatic it, you could have optioned one of these with a five speed manual however the one i found is an automatic so right here you have the shift indicator, the prindle as some may refer to it. Now you see right here it's in park, the indicator's pretty much there. But if I put it down into drive, now this here is drive position, okay? On the column. However, the truck will not shift correctly if it's here. For me to go into drive, I have to put the needle right about here. Now if you watch the action on the lever, so here's drive, okay? And that's where it needs to be. So it's actually slightly past the notch for drive. Now, what this is, I'm not sure. Um, some people said that it's just the indicator in here not lining up and you take it apart and adjust. I have my doubts on that because I feel like I wouldn't have to physically pull it past that notch inside the column to get it there. I'm thinking maybe the shift linkage is bad. Let me show you the shift linkage on this truck. And I'll actually start under the hood for that. Now this is not a cable operated automatic shifter. See right here at the top of the column, I hope you can see, is a little lever that attaches to the inside shift lever. That actually runs into a series of rods and hinged connections that run down to the transmission. Let's go underneath. Uh, so right there where the sun is glaring through, you can kind of see there is more shift linkage. It runs over this direction and over to the transmission and right there is where it pulls I do believe it's a little bit different than the one in my old Chevy obviously because the Dodge my old 76 Chevy has the same type of setup mechanical not cable you know it's rods um, I imagine something here is probably just worn out um, not necessarily bad like it's gonna fail but it's just worn out and maybe something stretched maybe a bushing or something and that's causing me to have to pull the shifter in a weird way um, once again, not sure how common this is. However, I am experiencing that with mine. So something to keep in mind when you go to test drive one of these. If it feels funny when you put it into the actual drive position on the column, maybe try that. An interior feature that I am not the biggest fan of, and I imagine a lot of Dakota owners probably aren't either, is the cup holders. Now, if you're uninitiated, you don't know the first gen Dakotas, you're going to say this thing doesn't have cup holders. Are they right here? No, that's an ashtray. You notice here there is a piece of black trim in the middle of this wood. Not all of them have the wood, by the way. Some of them are black or whatever, but this one's wood. Fake. You see this piece of black trim. It says Dakota on it. Pull that, 
and you have cup holders. Now, these are 80s, 90s cup holders. These are not modern day cup holders. Now, they have a little support on the bottom. They are actually pretty sturdy. I've held, I, I can hold a 32 ounce McDonald's cup in here or anything that's got that tapered bottom. A 20 ounce bottle will not fit in this, period. It will not fit. I've seen, I've seen on the group I'm in, plenty of people um, will grind these out bigger so that they will fit a bottle. Um, I've just not elected to do that yet. Another thing these like to do, right now it's all the way in, but I guarantee you once I drive home, it'll probably be out about that far. These things like to just kind of ease their way out with vibrations of driving and whatnot. Um, I've heard of some people just fixing that with electrical tape. They might put it like somewhere in here or something, somewhere where it's going to create more friction. And uh, it's all that. Once again, something I just haven't done. Another big downside to that is in the heat of summer like it is right now, it's mid-80s, almost 90s right now. So it's very warm. If you got somebody riding over here, the sweat from the drinks is going to drip on their leg. That's one downside. Another one is if you're in my situation where you're climbing from one side of the truck to the other to get in and out, this thing will chew up your knees if it is out. I've tried a few times to carry a drink and then get out, and it, I mean, it rips the skin right off your knees. I don't like it, so... I'm not the biggest fan of this setup, but it's there. You do have cup holders. You don't have to add them on if you don't want to. The last thing I want to cover on the interior is kind of the most major. Now, let me get my phone out of the floor. I'm just trying to keep it cool in the shade. Anyway, water intrusion. Now, I've heard of plenty of Dakota owners experiencing this, and I have myself. I've come out here outside after a heavy, heavy downpour rain, depending on how the truck is parked, how it's angled and my floorboards will be kind of sopping wet not necessarily flooded so much but they are wet they're not right now but um and i've tried to ask around to figure out what this could possibly be one person said check the windshield seal that's something i'll have to look into eventually um some other people said check the cowl drains um, up underneath this cowl it drains down behind, behind these fenders those can be clogged and water will run up into the uh the intake for the AC system that's under here and get in as well. If you get water intrusion, just first thing, check all your seals. Your door seals, your window seals. Um, I think some people might have said something about these cab inserts right here. I'm not entirely certain on that, so don't quote me on that. I do not know for sure. Once again, other window seals here. So if you do get water intrusion, just start checking all that stuff. I mean, these are painted, and you see I've got the carpet up. These are coated, they're painted body color, so, you know, it's gonna, it'd take a lot for them to start rusting out. But, you know, your carpet can start to smell, start to mold. You don't want that, so keep, keep an eye out for that. You'll know if it happens. I don't know if all Dakotas experience it, but I know mine experiences it from time to time. All right, I want to talk a little bit about some electrical stuff. I'll start on the outside with the one thing on the outside that I think matters, and that's these headlights. Now, of course, the old style sealed beam headlights, they're glass, they're never, they're never gonna fog up, you're always gonna see out of them. These are plastic, and they do fog. Mine were fogged. Now, I found the YouTube video from Chris Fix on how to restore plastic headlights, and I did the best that I could. They are much better than they were, which definitely helped lighting. But also, keep in mind, these were in, made in the 90s, they had the incandescent or halogen bulbs in them. And those can wear out and they can they won't project as enough light i don't think the housings project enough either i'm not really certain on that but the tops and bottoms are not reflective just the uh, back and sides here what i would advise doing what several people have advised and what i have done is upgrade to led headlights now i've got a set of ox beam led headlights behind these um i, I'll, I could put a link in the description to the ones that i bought um, and while I'm at it, just to mention, I've also got ox beam switchback signal bulbs in the, in, down below, which are really cool. I'll link to those as well. And I'll also put a link to the video where I changed all this stuff out so you can see the process and see the before and after. But LED headlights, they're brighter, you can see further, they're a lower power draw, and hopefully they'll last longer too. But I am very pleased with this thing running LEDs. It's so much better to drive at night. All right, back in the driver's seat now. Another problem, electrical and related to the lighting, is this right here. This is the headlight switch. This is not the original headlight switch. This is a replacement. These switches love to go bad. And from my understanding, these Dakotas and most 90s Dodges 
used switches just like this. And instead of running the power through a separate relay, it all runs through this switch to all the lights, the headlights, the parking lights, the brake light, the tag lights, the uh, back lights. It all runs through these, through the switch. And of course, all that power with halogens and incandescents, it burns these up over time. You'll hear of Dakota owners replacing these over and over and over. So what I did, what somebody advised me to do and the advice that I took and I do not regret is I took and first I went on Rock Auto and I found the replacement switch. I bought it and I replaced the switch. And then like I just mentioned, I replaced the headlights and signals and side markers up front, all LED, my tail lights, reverse lights, tag lights in the rear, all are also LED. I didn't install any separate res um, relays or resistors or anything like that. I just replaced the switch and upgraded to LED. Once again, LED uses a lot less power than any incandescent. So hopefully, the theory is, and it should work, is that the lower power draw will extend the life of this switch. If I do have to replace it again, it's not the hardest job in the world. Um, I also replaced this switch in the video where I upgraded to LED lighting. So if you watch that video, you'll see how to do it in there as well. But common, common, common failure point. The way you'll know, at least what happened to me, is I was dri I'll was i be driving down the road at night. You know, I go to work super early in the morning, 3, 4 a.m. So I'll be driving up the highway about 15 minutes after I start driving. Especially if I'm using the high beams, they'll start flashing, flashing. And they won't stop until I kill the switch for a few seconds and then turn it back on and they'll behave for a little while. In fact, I barely ever ran my high beams because that was when it got the worst. And that's a switch breaking down. Ever since the, the new switch and the upgraded LEDs, I've not had any of those issues. So do keep that in mind if you're shopping for this Dakota or really any 90s Dodge product. Another thing people complain about con consistently in this group is the gauge cluster. Apparently these things wear out electronically, the electronics break down and they stop working. You'll hear about tachometer, speedometer not working, um, fuel gauge not working. Um, in that respect, I hear a lot of fuel gauge not working. In fact, I kind of posted a little thing in the group when my truck rolled over to 200,000 units because that's kind of a celebratory thing. And one guy commented and said, your fuel gauge works, man, I am so jealous. You know, because apparently it's very common that these don't work. Um, in that respect, people have told me that it could be something fuel pump related. Um, yes, it could be re related to the gauge, something electrical, but I've also heard that it could be fuel pump related. The, the sender going bad inside the fuel tank, at which point you have to replace. People have reported that the fuel pumps do go out on these things. Once again, there are old trucks. That's something to kind of expect with an old vehicle. The fuel pump will go out. I think mine's already been replaced because I kind of thought I saw signs of that, but not entirely sure. Just something else to look out for. Um, you know, if you start experiencing problems that seem like you're not, may not be getting fuel, you're probably looking at a fuel pump. Other complaints that I got when I posted this question to the group to get this information a lot of people said that they've had to replace transmissions now mine as far as I understand is the factory transmission the the stock unit that came in the truck obviously I'm not entirely certain I've had it two years and I don't know much about the history of the truck other than the previous owner had it for like 20 years but transmission seems to work very well in this truck I don't have any complaints on it but people do say the transmissions you may want to keep an eye on them as well um, someone also mentioned an ABS valve, so the ones that have analog brakes might go bad. That's something you have to look into. Oh, either that or just regular braking and you are the ABS. I um, heard a complaint, someone talking about starter bolts on the NV3500 manual that was used from 94 to 04 Dakotas. So if you, if you get the manual from 94 and even into the newer generations in 04. Get in and just check and make sure the starter bolts are still in there good and they're nice and tight and if the starter's hanging on. And the last thing to touch on is a very, very common issue with these Dakotas and something that I've experienced as well is your wiper linkage. So here's the windshield wipers. And you see I have a lot of play in these wipers. And what happens is over time there are bushings on this wiper linkage you know, at the places where the different parts of the linkage connect that will wear out they'll crumble and you know your wipers won't work right in my case it was a rainy day i went up to clinton it started raining i turned my switch and they didn't move 
the motor under the cowl was turning, but the linkage had come disconnected from it. Now, I didn't go and try to find the bushings. I don't know how easy they are to find, but because I needed it that day, I cobbled together a little thing. I jerry-rigged it with some washers. I think I had to drill one or two of them out. Some, just some flat washers and some cotter pins and such and put that all back together and it's 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 worked okay since then eventually i might get in there and do a proper bushing replacement but I'll, eh, or i'll just run with it as long as i can but again very common issue check that out because you may end up having to fix the wiper linkage another note if you're looking to if you're asking can these things pull well, i'm not sure the exact towing capacity on these things when i looked online something suggested about 3800 pounds not sure if that's high or low or if it's even true but I do know this, that before I got a hold of this, somebody definitely did some towing with this truck. It's up under the dash, you see here's the trailer brake controller. Go around to the bed, and I walk through some weeds, like an idiot, and pull back this bed liner. I don't think I can get, I don't think I can get you a shot there, but somewhere in here, I've had this out, there is a 7 pin or something like that connector right in here and if I pull the bed liner out right here and here just about on both sides there's some holes in the bed that would suggest to me that there may have been a fifth wheel back here kind of a small vehicle in my opinion to be pulling fifth wheel with but that's the only thing I can imagine being the reason why it would have been set up like so these things will also pull one day it may be tasked with pulling my c10 I don't know so there you have it there's all the things that I was able to find out that you need to look for when shopping for one of these trucks. And of course the things that I am personally experiencing with my 94 SLT. Now this information in this video was not meant to scare anybody off to make people say, well I'm not going to buy one of those and all those problems. These are great trucks and they have a huge following of people that absolutely love these things. My truck is sitting at 202,000 miles right now on what I can only assume is the original engine and transmission. And I've seen people say, show their trucks online that have reached over 400,000 miles. The biggest thing you gotta consider is how was it taken care of before you get it? And how are you gonna take care of it? If you're not ready to face the problems that an old vehicle has, then you're not ready to buy one of these trucks or anything from the 90s that matter because once again the newest one of these trucks is 25 years old minus 27 i mean these things at this point i think you can probably register any first generation dakota as a classic vehicle remember old stuff has problems i don't care if it's people cars electronics it's going to have issues that being said i love this truck i mean you've seen the walk around you've seen it it looks ugly as sin because the paint's all bad it's got the rusted frame Although it's still solid, but these are amazing trucks that people absolutely love them. The best piece of advice that I can give anyone when they're looking for any of these trucks or anything, especially this old, is to find a community where you can find an information about these things. Go online and find a forum, find a Facebook group. In my past, I've had a 94 Nissan Harder Body pickup truck. I had a 93 actually two 93 Ford Explorers from the first generation. I had a 95 Camaro from the second the fourth generation my bad And I currently have a 1976 Chevy C10 for every single one of those vehicles I was able to go online and locate a forum page where I could go and ask a question look up answer find advice on What goes what goes on with these vehicles how to fix the problems? What are common issues you need to look out for and how to take care of it? In this case, when I got this truck and started making videos about it, somebody commented on one of my videos and pointed me towards a Facebook group that's pretty much just like that. The name of the group is Dodge Dakota First Generation 1987 to 1996, worded exactly like that. Now, if, I, if I'm able, I'll put a link in the description, or at least I will at least put it down there so you know how to how to search. Go on there. Request to join, got approved, you know, they're gonna ask a few questions, you know, what's the year you're Dakota, are you a Dakota owner, things like that. Get rid of the terms, you're good. And it has been an absolute wealth of knowledge regarding these trucks. There are people on there that have owned these things for years. They've owned multiple of these trucks. There are people who have owned these for as long as they've been making them. 
or as long as they make them. I should, and whenever I have a concern, I want to know why something's happening with my truck. I want to know how to fix something. I want to know common issues. That's where I go. When I wanted to gather the information to make this video, that's where I went. I posted in that group. I said, I need my experienced Dakota owners in the community to help me out. I need the information, common issues, and people were more than happy to start commenting and giving me information. On top of finding information on the trucks, it's just a cool, fun place to go and see what other people are doing with these trucks. See their lifted 4x4s, their lowered two-wheel drives, their custom builds, their engine swaps. You can go on there and just simply find out what people recommend for aftermarket wheels. What's the biggest tire I can put on here? Wonderful place to go. It's one of my favorite places to go to look up information on these trucks. And I'm very thankful I was pointing in that direction. And that's why I'm pointing everybody that's watching this video in that direction. Because I think it's a very smart choice to go on there and join that group. Because there are, like I said, there's a lot of knowledgeable people who are more than happy to help these trucks. They love them to death. And they want to see as many of them continue to go down the road as possible. And with that, that's going to do it for this informative Buyer's Guide video on the first generation Dodge Dakota. I hope that I have provided you guys enough information to decide whether or not you want to buy one of these trucks. And if you do go through with it, what to look out for and how to give these trucks the love that they deserve. If you enjoyed this video, if you want to see more from, from me on this truck and other things on my channel, I encourage you to go down below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you'll know when I put other things up. Go follow me on Facebook and Instagram at that Comblock channel. I always post to there when a new video goes up. It's another way to get notified. And although I'm currently bad at it right now, I do want to start putting a little more stuff up on those platforms. With that being said, uh, once again, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll leave you with one last warning about these trucks, and that is that if you do buy one of these things, be very very careful because there's a very high chance that you may just fall in love with these things. Take care guys.